And let's, uh, let's read a few verses here. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we, underline this, who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Jesus Christ have been baptized in his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, even so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with, so we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Father, please take uh, the truth of, of these verses and those following and, and run them over the groove of our heart in a way that they would uh, be so indelibly imprinted we would not forget them. We'll give you praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. How do we refuel freedom? I love that song we sang a few moments ago about uh, death being arrested. It goes so well uh, with this passage tonight. I I think part of the problem with many of of our lives is that we have spent much of our time dealing with the fruit of issues rather than the root. If you want to kill a tree, you don't go pick all the apples off. That would not kill a tree. It would just get rid of that fruit for one season. But next year, they'd all come back. And when it comes to our lives, there are certain desires that we have, but, but what is the root? What is the disease that causes those desires, the, the, the symptoms? We, we could talk about all kinds of symptoms of sin, and we need to. We read through a list in Ephesians last night of, of lying and stealing and, and our words. And all the, that, there's all kinds of lists like that in Scripture. But what is, what is the source of all those symptoms? The, the Bible describes sin as breaking God's law in thought, word, or deed. So sin is breaking the law of God in thought, word, or deed. But what causes the thoughts, words, and deeds? It is the spirit of pride, the carnality, and the selfishness that has not been dealt with. And until you chop out the pride and carnality and selfishness, then all those things are just going to keep on coming back. And, and a lot of times, all we do is deal with the, the surface, the manifestation. So, so tonight, I, I want to share with you how to chop out the, the root of sin in your life, how to deal. If you, will, if you will, on a daily basis, deal with three things every morning, every morning as I try to get up, as I try to get up, as I do get up every morning, I try to deal with these three things every morning. And I, I, I pray if you'll start this pattern, I believe it can be very freeing in your life. I was reading a book some years ago. And uh, the author told a story about a, um, a guy who wanted to go on a, on a cruise. He was, he was just enamored by cruises, never been on one, didn't have much money. And so he went down to the travel agent and said, I want to go on a, a weeks-long Caribbean cruise. This is all the money I have. Can I do it? And the travel agent said, there's one leaving tomorrow. And because it's, you know, last minute, I, I can get you. It's not going to be the best stateroom, but I don't care what the stateroom's like. If I can get on with this money, I'll take it. So he spent every dime he had, but he got this ticket. He was so excited. He went home that night. He started packing his clothes. It was going to be great. Then the thought came to him, what am I going to do for spending money? That's okay. I don't don't need any trinkets and stuff. And then the thought came to him, what am I going to do for food? Never been on a cruise before. So, So he got some peanut butter and some white bread, and he made himself a week's worth of peanut butter sandwiches. So he had one suitcase with sandwiches in it, one suitcase full of clothes, went back down to next morning, got up, went down there to the ship and went up the gangplank and they showed him where his room was. It was at the bottom, but that was okay. So he went in there, unloaded all his clothes in one drawer, peanut butter sandwiches in another, went back up the deck of the ship. They were having their bon voyage party and they set sail and it was great. It was got time for dinner. He went down the elevator, got a peanut butter sandwich, got some water, choked it down, went back up the deck of the ship. Next morning, peanut butter sandwich for breakfast, one for lunch, one for supper. Next day, same thing. Now, it, it wasn't bad. It was a beautiful day and he was enjoying the cruise. But after about three days, you know, those, those sandwiches started getting stale and crusty and hard, you know. And to make matters worse, on, on the way to the elevator, he had to pass all these eating areas. And he'd see all these people just gorging themselves with all kinds of luscious food. He'd be sitting by the pool, and the, and the porter would bring a, a tray out to the person next to him just filled with food. And after about three days, he just lost it. 
He grabbed one of those porters. He said, listen, I, I have got to have a meal like that. I have no money, but, but I'll peel potatoes. I'll swab the decks. What do I have to do to get a meal like that? And the porter said, sir, all you have to do is ask. The food comes with the cruise. Okay, anyway, yeah, so, so here's the deal. Uh, for, for many of us, we are kind of sailing through life living on stale peanut butter sandwiches when Jesus said this, I am come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Why are we not enjoying the abundant Christian life? I'm not talking about name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, but why, why are we living in defeat in so many areas of our life? I believe it's because we've not understood this passage or lived in this passage the way God wants us to. So, so, so three things. If you'll do every morning as you get up, if you'll deal with three things, the first one is just called the search life. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You understand this. It's just saying, God, search me, try me, know me. David said this in Psalm 139. Reveal anything in my life where I have sin. That you, you don't have to go on a witch hunt. You don't have to try to find something. If you just feel bad, that's not God. God's not just going to make you feel bad. If there's something wrong, he's going to say, this is your problem. Confess it. Pride, the, the enemy rather wants us to deal in generalities. So you're just a bad person. No, you're not a bad person. You've done some bad things. And if you confess those things, you can move on. So, so ask God, anything you want me to, to see in my life, what he shows you, repent. Turn. God, you're right. I, I yelled at my child yesterday. I, I got angry at that situation. I, I lied. Whatever it was, I repent. And then replace it, put the right thing back in. We read yesterday, let him that stole, steal no more, rather let him work, laboring with his hands, so he might have to give to those that have need. And, and so you put something back into his life. Now, 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 we understand that pretty much, right? We understand confession. So, so on a daily basis, to get up and say, God, anything in my life I need to confess and deal with that. The second one is the searched life, or the surrendered life, and it's found here in, in Romans chapter 6. Six. So daily deal with sin, and secondly, deal with self. In this passage, there are four selves. There's, there's the old self, the new self, myself, and himself. And, and we got to deal with all four. We understand the old self, the new self, myself, and himself. That would be God. So let's look at the, what, what, does, that, what does that mean? What is the self life? So back to, to chapter 6, verse 1. Shall we keep on sinning so we can get more grace? No. It's, it's wonderful and true that God gives forgiveness and grace and mercy, but you don't just keep sinning so you can get more grace. May it never be. He who has died, how shall he who died to sin live any longer therein? And, and then he, he uses this illustration. It's the picture of baptism. And, and so when there's a baptism, when Pastor Jeremiah baptizes, he, he takes someone, and, and the reason that we do immersion, right, you do that here, uh, because it's, it's just a better picture of, of what happens, because it's a picture of a death. So, so you put someone under the water, it's a picture of, of, of death going down under the ground, but you don't leave them there, right? Okay, yeah, you don't leave them there, you, you pull them back up, otherwise the, the illustration will only be half complete. He said, just as baptism pictures, you're identifying with Christ, you go down in the waters, picturing the death, but you don't stay there, then we're raised in the light of his resurrection. Verse six. So here's what, I, here's what I want you to see, three things here. Number one, knowing this, there's something God wants us to know. Knowing this, that our old self, here's might say the old man, it's the old self. My old self was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died, now he, he's talking to living people. I'm not talking about physical death. He's talking to a church. The book of Romans was written to a group of believers who live in the city of Rome. So he says, talking to live people. He who has died, not, not died physically, but died to that old Adamic nature they were born with. So, so the old man, the old self is dead. And, and God wants us to acknowledge that. Now, now, we don't like to acknowledge that. What, is that. what is that old self? Adam was born with a nature to do right, and, and, and God gave him a choice. He said, listen, you can do right, but if you, if you eat from this one tree, then, then you're going to lose your freedom. So just, just be free. Just don't, don't eat from that one tree. And we sit there and say, why was Adam even around that tree? We would have done the same thing. We'd be sitting there saying, how come I can't have that tree? I got 10 million other trees, but I want that tree. And that's just kind of the way we are, right? You see a sign that says wet paint, what do you do? Touch it. Is it still wet? I mean, that's just kind of the, the, the way that we are, right? 
And so, so Adam, when he chose to sin, he lost his freedom of choice. But in Christ, now we've regained our freedom of choice. The Old Testament looked forward to the death of Christ. We look back at the death of Christ. And in Christ, we have regained our freedom of choice. A, a lost person has no choice. A person who is not a Christ follower really has no choice. Christ was talking to some of the Pharisees, some of the, uh, and, and he said to them, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you're going to do. The fact is, everything a lost person does is sin. It's sin for a lost person to pray. The Bible says the prayer of the wicked is an abomination. The Bible says it's sin for a lost person to, to give. The Bible says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. It's sin for a lost person to go to work. The Bible says the plowing of the wicked is sin. For them to plow their crop, plant their field, not because that's a sinful thing, but their motive is not for the glory of God. Whatever we do that's not for God and for his glory and his kingdom is sin. What serves not as faith is sin. So everything a lost person does is sin. I I try to get mad at lost people. Lost people don't really have any choice. It doesn't make it right. But I understand that lost people do lost things. You know what's hard to understand? When saved people do lost things. What's that about? Because, because we have been set free. We don't have to do that. I can do everything a lost person can do, but there's one thing I can do that they can't. I can choose not to. I can stop. And, and, and the problem is we have been so wrapped up in, well, I just, I just have no choice. It's kind of the way I am. You know, the devil made me do it. No, that's not true. As a believer, the old man died. The Adamic nature you were born with. You've been given a new self, a new nature, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God. We're going to talk about that more in, in just a minute. So, so what that means is this. I don't have to sin anymore. Now, I'm not saying you won't sin. In fact, I know you will. But you don't have to. We, we, don't, we have a choice now. Now, now that's, that's good news. Turn to the person next to you and say to them, I don't have to sin anymore. Say to the person next to you. I wonder if you really believe that. How many of you, many of you think it's possible for you personally to go an entire 24-hour period without consciously committing a sin? I'm assuming it's possible for you personally. Okay, couple. How about this? How about one hour? Possible for you personally to go one hour without consciously committing a sin. I'm just saying, one hour. Possible for you personally. Okay, a few more. Okay, one minute. Possible for you personally to go one minute without consciously committing a sin. I'm just saying, one minute. Possible for you personally. Okay, one second. (laughs) Possible. Is it possible for you personally to go one second, now listen, without consciously committing a sin. Possible. I mean, it's possible if you do one second. Okay? Why are we so hesitant to do that? It, it's true. If you can go a second, you can go a minute, you can go a minute, you can go an hour, you can an hour, you can go a day. But why, why do we have such hesitancy to acknowledge that? Because we have this attitude, I'm just this old rotten, horrible sinner saved by grace. We are sinners saved by grace. But I'm just, that's just kind of the way I am. And it's kind of like telling your kids, now tomorrow, you're, you're going to go to school, you're going to mouth off, you're going to probably steal somebody's lunch money, probably get in a fight, but try to do your best, would you? And that's the way we start our day. Now, now, now God, um, today, I'm, I'm probably going to lie and steal, I'm probably going to be immoral, probably going to be angry, but I'll be back tomorrow to confess it all. What a horrible way to live. Listen, I don't, <clears throat> I don't ever plan to sin again in my life. How many of you are planning to sin? Let me see your hand if you're planning to sin. Let me see your hand. Of course not, unless you have a radar detector in your car. But other than that, you're, 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 not, uh, you're not planning to sin. I was, I was in a meeting uh, some time ago, and, uh, and, and a, um, there was a judge in the church, and he gave a testimony during Sunday school time, and he said God convicted him. Here, here I am, a judge. I've got a radar detector in my car. And, and he said, that, that's, and I, I'm, just, I'm planning to sin, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of my radar detector. After church, I was talking to him. He said, Steve, in between Sunday school and church, I went to the bathroom, and three men came and offered to buy it from me. <laughs> They, they, they kind of uh, missed the whole, the whole point of the message there, right? Uh, uh, but, but we don't plan to sin. You say, Steve, well, well, do you sin? I, I do sin. Well, if you don't have to sin, then why do you sin? We live in this body of flesh. That's myself. Old self, new self, myself. I live in this body of sin, this body of flesh. 
And, and as long as I live in this body of flesh, I'm gonna have temptation. Temptation is the enticement to satisfy a God-given desire in a God-forbidden way. Listen to that again. Temptation is the enticement to satisfy a God-given desire in a God-forbidden way. Every temptation comes to the point of a God-given desire. For example, it, it is a God-given desire to have sex. That sex is not a dirty word. God invented sex. He could have made us had kids by mixing earwax together if he wanted to, but that's not the way he chose, all right? So, so it was God's idea. But when we involve ourselves in sex outside of the boundaries of this book, that's when it's wrong. A God-given desire made in a God-forbidden way. You know that it's, it, it, it's a, it's a God-given desire to eat. Nothing wrong with eating. But when we overeat, that's called gluttony. So the temptation is not just to have our needs met, but to overeat or to be gluttonous in our appetites. You know, it's even a God-given desire to get revenge. The Bible says we should get revenge. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Revenge is fine as long as you're blessing and praying. But we, at the point of a God-given desire, try to get that desire met in a God-forbidden way. And so when there is temptation, that temptation comes, and we live in this body of flesh. I don't have to give in. I don't have to. I don't sin because I have to. I sin because I choose to. And every sin you commit, you've pushed Jesus off the throne of your life and said, I'm going I'm to decide. I'm, I'm going to run my own life. And there's never going to be a sin in your life that you ever commit. You haven't pushed Christ off the throne and jump back on and say, I I'm going to do it because I, I want to be in charge. Now turn the person next to you and say, I sin because I choose to. Tell the person next to you that. That's, that's not quite as fun. And, and, and here's the deal. We, we don't live in the freedom that we've just been singing about. That song we sang a few moments ago, I'm free, free. That's this guy singing that song. But when I ask you, can you potentially go a day without consciously sinning? Maybe. Why? Why? Yes, I have the potential for that. My plan tomorrow is to go all day without sinning. What are you planning to do? Only do 10? 15? What are you, what are you planning? You're planning not to. But the, but the reality is we don't live in the freedom. We sing those songs. But see, that's most, you don't believe that. We don't believe we're free. We like to sing the songs, but don't live that way. I don't sin because I have to. He said, well, Steve, if, if you, why, why do you sin? I live in this body of flesh. And every day I get to go to the polls. Every day there's an election. Who is going to sit on the throne of my life? Every day is an election. I go and I, I got to pull the lever and, and make sure all those hanging chairs. See, the, the flesh is present, but it does not have to be president. It's a choice every day. Again, lost people have no choice. But as a, a follower of Christ, something has changed. I've been given a new nature. I have a choice in that. And so do you. I heard about a guy who lived in an old, rotten, run-down apartment complex. It's just a disaster. And, and nothing worked, and the landlord was just a bear, and, and he'd, he'd signed his lease, couldn't get out of it. Every time he'd call the landlord and say, you know, I got a leaky faucet or whatever, he'd say, I'll fix it yourself. The landlord was always there on rent day saying, you better have that money or you're going to jail. One day, he was sitting in his, in his room, just kind of miserable as usual. He heard a knock at the door. He thought, oh, man, is, is it time for the rent already? Didn't want to even answer the door, but they kept knocking. And so he peered through a crack, and he saw it wasn't the old landlord. It was some guys in construction uniforms. He went and opened the door, said, can I help you? They said, yes, we've kind of remodeled your apartment. He let them in. For the next two weeks, they renovated the place. I mean, they, they put new carpet and new wallpaper and painted the ceilings. They, they put a, a, a sleep number bed in the, in, in, in the bedroom and a jacuzzi in the bathroom and in the kitchen, all new appliances, garbage disposal, microwave, refrigerator with ice cubes in the door. It's everything. All new furniture, lazy boat recliner with a vibrating button and a heater pad. It, it was just great. And they finished all their work and they're packing up and they're leaving. And as they do, this guy follows them out with his suitcases packed. And they stopped and said, is, is there a problem? Why, why, why are you leaving? He said, he said, I can't live here. I couldn't afford this place. It was a dump. Now it's incredible. I can never afford this. They said, we forgot to tell you. Somebody bought out this apartment complex, and they want all the tenants to live here free of charge. No costs. If you have a need, by the way, uh, they, 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 they'll help you get a job. they provide finances. Here's their card. Give them a call. They're available 24 hours a day. You have a nice day. And they left. Man, this guy was just blown away. 
He went and, and got set down in his new lazy boy recliner and kicked up the leg stand, turned on the vibrating button, heater pad, and floated off in Never Never Land. I mean, this is just great. Hadn't sat there too long, though, until he heard a knock at the door. He jumps up, swings the door open, and here stands the old landlord. The old landlord says, what are you doing? Oh, man, I'm enjoying my new place. This is so great. And, and the old landlord says, it was all a mistake. Says, what do you mean? They, they got the wrong apartment. It was supposed to be across the street. All this stuff you have in here, it's not yours. And if you don't get it moved out into my truck, I'm going to bill you for every dime of it. And, and, and the guy says, I, I didn't think you owned this place anymore. I own this place. Your rent is due. And you better pay up or you're going to jail. And this guy was in such a habit of obeying that old landlord he moved out the furniture and paid the rent, even though he didn't have to. You know, that's, that's a, picture of, a picture of our life. God, God finds us in a miry pit. He pulls us up. He sets us on a solid rock. He gives us a new lease on life. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. He renovates our life from top to bottom. He gives us a new lease on life. And then he says, listen, if you need anything, I am available 24-7. You know God has a phone number? God's phone number is Jeremiah 33.3. Call unto me, and I'll show you great and mighty things, which I know it's not. He's available. And, and, and all this is ours. And then the old landlord, the devil, comes along and says, um, yell at your kids. I don't think I should do that. Yell at, yes, sir. Watch that program. Man, I'm not sure I should watch that program. Watch that program, yes, sir. He has no authority over you. He has no control, but we were in such a habit of responding that way in the past, of obeying the old landlord, we just do it not because we have to. We've been set free. I'm free, free. We sang it, but we don't live it because we're not claiming or living in this truth. So there's something he wants us to know. The old man, the Adamic nature we were born with is dead. We were in a, I was, I was talking to a uh, a friend of mine, and he was in a meeting some years ago, and, and uh, the pastor asked him to talk to a lady uh, in his church, and, and, and he said, we've tried to help her, we can't speak any place, and so my friend said, I probably can't either, but he, he went to this room with this lady, another lady, and, and um, didn't even know what her problem was, and, and uh, so he's trying to talk to her and give her some input, and, and, uh, and every time he got close to the, what her problem was, she started crying uncontrollably. Oh, it's just so terrible, and, and so finally, after a half hour, he calmed her down enough to get out what the problem was. And she said this, my problem is, I swear, I take God's name in vain. I've tried to stop, but I just can't. She's just crying again. So my friend gave her some, some thoughts. And after about 45 minutes, he, he's getting no place. And he says, ma'am, your problem is you don't want to stop swearing. Oh, yes, I do. I've tried to stop. And he says, no, you don't want to stop. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I, no, you don't. Yes, I, no, you don't. He said, lady, you've been in this room for 45 minutes. You haven't swore one time. She said, oh, I wouldn't think of swearing in front of a preacher. Oh, you choose where you swear, do you? And, and, and see, if you can choose not to do it when you're here, you can choose not to do it when you get out of here. I, I've never been in a service where, where, where a wife slapped her husband. I've seen some elbow him awful hard, but, I, but I've never seen anybody slap him. Because for two hours not, you choose not to. I've never been in a service where a man pulled out a pornographic magazine and started reading it. Why? Because for two hours not, you've chosen not to. And if you can choose not to do it here, if you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, you can do it when you get out of here. But we sin not because we have to. We sin because we choose to. Now, let's, let's go on this passage. I look on down here at, the, at the verse number 9. He goes on at verse number 11. He says, even so, verse 11 is Romans 6, 11. Even so, consider yourselves. King James says, reckon yourselves. I guess that's because Paul is a southerner, I reckon, whatever. But, but what, what the word means is to believe. Consider yourselves dead to sin. There it is again, dead to sin. But don't stay dead. You ever uh, watch an old Western movie and, you know, the wanted sign says wanted dead and alive? This verse should have been entitled wanted dead or alive. Not dead and alive. Not, 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 not dead or alive, but dead and alive. Dead to sin, yes, but you don't stay under the water. Dead and alive, dead to sin, but alive to God. And, and, and the, the, the thing for us to consider to believe is that I can choose against sin and self. That's what this teaches. You don't believe that yet, but that's what this teaches. I am dead to sin, but alive to God. And, and the fact is, we, we, don't, we don't really live that way. We don't really believe that. You probably know, um, there, there's a famous couple of verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice. What is the problem with a living sacrifice? 
it crawls off the altar, exactly. So, so we present ourselves a living sacrifice on the altar of God, but then we see God taking our life someplace we're not really sure we want to go, and we jump off that sacrificial altar, and we jump back on the throne because we're not sure God really knows. And, and, and what he says is, consider yourself dead to sin. Don't, don't be living. Christ living in you. Believe you can choose against, you can choose against sin. Listen, in the throne of your heart, there, there was only one chair, one stool. And, and when you got saved, what you said was, God, I want you to sit on the throne. I'm going to be on the sacrificial altar over here, and you stay on the throne. But only one person can sit there. You ever seen two people try to sit on the same chair? This may come as a shock to you, but Jeremiah is a little bit competitive. And, and um, I remember when he was young and uh, Stephen was young, uh, we had like, uh, you know, three little boys, and then, and then we had our, our fourth little boy. And so when we had our fourth little boy, um, we had the car seat deal, you know. So Debbie would sit with a van, so Debbie sat in the second seat with the car seat with Ben. That left the passenger seat available. And that was the seat of choice. And so any place we would go, time we'd go someplace, they would run out of the house, and all three, Stephen, Jeremiah, and Josh, would all head for that one chair. And one would come in through my door, one through the side door, one through, and they'd all converge in this one chair because who got to be there first got shotgun. And it was a competition, and it was a fight, and they would all arrive about the same time. And you put three young boys on one chair at one time, you have war. That's what you have right there. Now, in the throne of your heart, there's one chair, and, and, and you gave that stool, you gave that chair to God when you got saved. I want you to be in charge. And then you sit there and say, but God, I'm, I, I think maybe you, you haven't been down here for a while, and things are changing. You probably don't even know the internet. So, so, so maybe, Lord, maybe, I, why don't you sit in the back seat and, and, uh, and let me run my own life? Now, we wouldn't say it like that, but that's the choices we're making. And, and we push him off the throne. We keep God in the trunk just in case, like a spare tire, in case we get in a wreck, in case we have a problem. And, and he says, I, I, that is not the position that I signed up for. That is not the position that you agreed to. You were going to sit on the sacrificial altar, and God was going to sit on the throne. And the problem is we don't do that. If you believe that is true, if you believe God wants to do that, and you take that position, you can live a life of victory over sin, of victory in the things you're having struggles with. But we, 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 don't, we don't live that way. And as a result of that, we have not... Now, listen, you're going to be somebody's slave. I mean, look on a few verses later in this passage in Romans. You're, you're going to be the slave of sin, or you're going to be the slave of righteousness. Look down at verse 16. Don't you know that when you present yourselves as someone as slaves for obedience... You are the slaves of the one whom you, you, you obey. And here's your options. Either sin resulting in death, that's you sitting on the throne, or obedience resulting in righteousness. You're going to be someone's slave. Every freedom has a corresponding bondage. Every bondage a corresponding freedom. You can either be a slave to your toothbrush and free from cavities, or you can be free from your toothbrush and a slave to cavities. Your every freedom has a corresponding bondage. And either you're going to be a slave to sin or a slave to God. And, and so much better to be a slave to God and let him have the throne and you stay on the altar. But we, we, have, a hard time, we have a hard time living that way. And, and, and if you want to know who really is alive in your life, it doesn't really show up right here. It shows up in the way you live at home. What you do behind the doors of your home. Would Jesus watch that? Would Jesus talk like that? The way you interact with your family? Is that how Jesus would live? Listen, every time God's will and your will cross, you make a choice. God says, I, I want you to read my word. And your flesh says, I want to watch TV. And you die to what you want, and you go God's way. God says, I want you to uh, respect that authority. And your flesh says, I don't like that authority. And you die to it, you want to go God's way. God says, I want you to fast. And your flesh says, I want to feast. You die to it, you want to go God. Every time God's will and your will cross, you get to make a choice. This is not a one-time act. We all come to the altar and say, from now on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be dead to myself and let God live. No, it, it, it's not a one-time thing. Paul said, always bearing in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's a process for us. He said, see, I, I, I can't love my husband, my wife, the way I'm told to. You're, that's right, you can't. Get off the throne. See, I, I can't stop this habit issue. Of, that's right, you can't. Get off the throne. As long as you're seated on the throne of your life, running your own life, making your own choices, you're going you're to crash. But when you vacate that throne and you believe what this passage says and you stay on that sacrificial altar, you, you can live in victory. But, but we don't do that because we don't stay dead. Now, let's just say that um, tonight in the service, Jeremiah falls over in the chair and dies and kind of messes up the service. And so, so we're going to have his, his funeral. And so we're all walking past his casket, and we're just talking about how natural he looks and, you know, whatever. And let's just say that for some reason, you didn't like Jeremiah. I don't know why he wouldn't. He's just a wonderful person, but let's say you didn't like him. And so after everyone kind of clears away, you look back there in that coffin, you say, I'm glad you're gone. I never liked you anyway. I didn't like your attitude, attitude. You got bad breath, bad breath, B.O. I am glad you're gone. And, and about that time, he sits straight up in the coffin and punches you in the face. You know what his problem was? He wasn't dead. He was just real sick. And that's our problem. But we're not dead. We're just real sick. You let somebody push us a little bit too far, we get out of the coffin, off the cross, off the altar. Now, if you're really dead and I insulted you, what would you do if you're really dead? If I started pulling all the hairs out of your beard, if you're really dead, what would you do? Nothing. If I started tickling you in your most ticklish spots, really dead, what would you do? Nothing. Nothing. You know why? Because death is the inability to respond. That's what death is, the inability to respond. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You cannot offend a dead person. And the reason we react, the reason we get angry, because we're not dead. We aren't physically dead, but we have to live as if we are off the throne and we're on that sacrificial altar. And the problem, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy to live like that. Not, not at all. But we want to say, is less of me and more of thee. No, it's none of me and all of him. And again, how you live at home shows who's really alive. What you talk about what you think about, what you're motivated by. Is, is it a one-time commitment? No. Always bearing it on my body, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, uh, 14, 10, 4, 10. Always bearing it on my body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. The, the Christian life is not easy. If somebody told you it was easy, then they, they lied to you. We, we want advancement, no adversity. We want life, no death. We want growth, no pressure. We, we, just, we just want it to be easy, Right? It's like, um, I, I read someplace, there are 80 million overweight people in America. Those are round figures. And, and um, I read this article about it, and, and uh, I don't understand, um, you ever go to the um, grocery store and they have the checkout stand, they have these gossip magazines, I'm not sure who buys these things, but, but there's, there's a, a caption on some bar or some column, they'll say something like this, try our new diet, lose weight easily. Or, or try this movie star's diet, anything you want, lose 10 pounds a week, you know, no effort. Or try our new banana and coconut diet, you don't lose weight, but you can climb trees, whatever. And, and, and people buy those things like mad, why? Because they say easy, no effort. Now answer me this, is it easy to lose weight, yes or no? Absolutely not. And, and, and we want to have everything go, we want just to have the ease life. Listen, here, here's what I found. What, what, whatever is keeping you from dying is keeping you from living. Whatever you're unwilling to die to, whatever you're saying, I, I've got the right to this. I've got the right to my temper. If someone wrongs me, I'm going to honk at them. I, I, I've got the right to my freedom. No one's going to tell me what to do. I, I've got the right to, to my position. I've worked hard for this position. I've got the right to the good life. I work hard. I, I deserve to have this. I've, I've got the right to my reputation. If someone says something, then they're going to they're gonna get it back because, because I've got that right. I've got the right to, to this area, uh, this, this little area of my life. Whatever is keeping you from dying is keeping you from living. When, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, hell broke apart at his feet. Why is that not happening for us? Because we're holding on to one little corner of hell. Jesus didn't hold on to any corners. And you've got to say, God, I, I'm going to acknowledge what you say is true. I, I, I don't have to live that way. Here's the third thing. For to, we're to know the old man is dead, and, and, and then we're to, thirdly, know, reckon, and thirdly, look at verse 13. 
Don't go on, look at verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. They used to obey it in its lusts. We still have sin because we have a body of flesh. And do not go on presenting the members of your body, this is verse 13, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not be master over you. No, reckon, and yield. So, so the third thing, if I'm going to deal with this, this self-life of myself, I've got to surrender it. And, 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 who, and I surrender that, I yield that to the lordship of Christ and my members to right living. He, he says, present your members. What's a member? Well, a hand, an eye, an ear. I, I try to, every morning as I get up, I try to say this, God, today I pray you look through my eyes, talk through my mouth, think through my mind, walk through my, I, I give him the members of my body I struggle the most with. I don't say, God, today you take care of my spleen, my hypothalamus, and work on my pancreas. Now, now those may be your problem issues. My problem issues are my eyes, my tongue, my ears, my mouth, my hand. I, I say, God, today, would you please look through my eyes today? Would you think through my mind? I, I, I try to present my problem members, especially, to God. And so I want you to live through me today. And, and we're really presenting them to the Holy Spirit. So here's the third thing. Daily deal with sin. Confess that. Deal with that. Self, the, 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 the self-life, and then the Holy Spirit of God. We, we talk about asking Jesus in our heart. Or where it, it's not Jesus who lives in our heart. It's the Godhead we sang a few moments ago, that triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it's really the Holy Spirit who indwells you. Here's just who the Holy Spirit is. This is just a quick treatise on the Holy Spirit. There's a great book um, by um, Francis Chan called The Forgotten God. I'll get that. It's a great book on the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit indwells us. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He lives inside of us. He convicts us. If you've ever been convicted of anything, that was the Holy Spirit convicting of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He, he baptizes us. A lot of confusion about that. I, I believe basically it just means he seals us into the family of God. And then here's the most famous verse, most known verse on the Holy Spirit. He fills us, Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine or his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that, 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 people use that verse to talk about drinking and so forth, which is fine. But the, the, the point of the verse is not about drinking. He's saying just as when alcohol enters your body, it affects every part of your body. Every part. You, 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 know, you don't pour you know, beer on your toe and say, my big toe got drunk. Uh, it doesn't work that way, right? It, it enters your bloodstream. It goes to every little capillary. So every part of your body is under the influence of that intoxicating beverage. And he said, just as alcohol permeates the entire body and intoxicates the whole person, the Holy Spirit is to fill or control or intoxicate, be in charge of, just as alcohol is in charge of a person's body when they put so much into it, the Holy Spirit should be in charge of your body. Let me explain it like this. We're made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Some would say two and go there. But you, you have this God-shaped void in your life. And, and if you're a follower of Christ, there was a time when, when, when the Holy Spirit of God drew you to himself. You were filled with the Spirit, and he came to live inside of you. The job of the Holy Spirit, then, is to make you look like Jesus, to make your life representative of Jesus. And so he begins to fill those areas of life. So he comes and he says, let me talk to you about your friends. Just some of the friends you're hanging with, they're not helpful to you. They're not a good influence on you. And I want to be in charge of, of who you go on vacation with and who you spend your intimate moments with. You, you, it doesn't mean you can't have friends in the world, but your close, intimate friends should be running to Christ. If they're not running to Christ, then you're running in the wrong direction. And you say, okay, Lord, you can have my friends. I will give you my friendships. And they said, I'm talking about your television. Just the things you're watching, it's just not best. Stop saying what's right with it and, or what's wrong with it. What's right with it? And I, I just want to be in control of reviewing habits. Okay, Lord, you can have that. And I want to talk about your clothing. Your clothing, it's not drawing attention to your face. It's drawing attention to some, some central part of your body. And I, I, want to, I want to be in charge of your wardrobe. Okay, Lord, you can have my wardrobe. I want to talk to you about your sports. It's just too important to you. You're spending so much time here. God's not against sports. But, but if it's a God, as we talked about the other night, I want to be in charge. I was, I was in a meeting in Texas where a man came to me and said, Steve, I, I, I would sit there on Sunday where the pastor was preaching. I'd be thinking about my golf swing. 
And I, I realized I couldn't even go through a service without thinking about golf. And so I went to my wife. I said, honey, it, this has been an idol in my life. My golf, my golf has. I'm putting my golf clubs in the closet. I am not going to take them out until you tell me to because you think it's no longer a God in my life. I'm not going to ask. Until, and I'm not going to take them out until you tell me. A year and a half later, she said to him, I think, honey, maybe you can take your golf clubs out again. He kept them in there for another year just to make sure. And, 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 and nothing wrong with it. He was just saying, I want God to be the God of everything. Nothing wrong with golfing. But, but if it's a God in your life, and, and what happens is the Holy Spirit comes into all these areas and he begins to make them look like Jesus, conforming them to the image of the Son. What does it take to stop the working of God in your life? All it takes is one time for you to say no. God comes and says, I want to talk to you about your finances. So wait a minute, God, I have given you my friends, my TV, my clothing, my sports. What do you want, everything? Yeah. <laughs> That's what he thought you were saying when you said all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. All means all. That's all all means. And his goal then is to conform every part of your life to come under the influence to look like Jesus. And then as it starts from the inside, it works to the outside so you're totally controlled and filled under the influence, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So when you get bumped, Jesus comes out. Not anger. Jesus comes out. We were uh, in a meeting, and there was a guy in the church. He was a, was a weightlifter. And he said, I went to the gym. We just understand. We shared this truth. He said, I went to the, the gym this morning, and I had these, he had these, you know, these huge bar and these huge weights. And he, was, he said, I was sliding some of those, those weights on this bar, and my finger got caught in the middle of them. And I jammed my finger. I jumped up. I said, praise the Lord. He about scared me to death. I looked in the mirror. I said, who said that? And he, he was filled with the Spirit. He got bumped. Jesus came out. That's why that verse is used in continuous action sense. It really means be on being filled. Because you should be spilling all the time. You're driving around the road, and, and somebody cuts in front of you, and you pray for them. You got bumped, and Jesus came out. But if you honk and yell and scream, whatever, it wasn't Jesus coming out of you. And so the job of the Holy Spirit is to so conform you to the Son that when you are so filled with the Spirit, when you get bumped, Christ comes out in everything that you do. Now, how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit of God? When you got saved, you got all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. The Holy Spirit is, is a person. You can't get part of a person. But how, and, and don't get hung up on the word filled. Use empowered or controlled or, or whatever. Don't let semantics trip you up here. But how do you live in the Spirit? Here, here's, here's on a daily basis. Admit to sin. That's, that's confession. Repent of whatever God shows you. Secondly, admit to your death. That's Romans 6. This is the process. So I, I reckon myself dead. I count it as a fact. I reckon myself, I should say dead, not death. Reckon yourself death. Reckon yourself dead, okay? I repent. I reckon myself dead. And then thirdly, here, here it comes. It's, it's really profound. Are you ready? I, I don't believe God makes things difficult. If you want to be controlled, filled, empowered by the Spirit, here's what you do. You say, I, I, Holy Spirit, I need you to fill me right now. You just ask. You realize you have a need. And, and you say, please fill me, control me, live through me. You say, Steve, how long does that last? Until you sin. <gasps> what do I do then? You admit it. God, I, I push you off the throne. I jump back in charge. That was wrong. Thank you for your forgiveness. I, I don't have to live that way. I'm dead to that. Holy Spirit, please fill me, control me, and live through me. How many times do you have to do that? Every time you sin. It may be 20 times a day. Maybe five times. Or it may be that tomorrow morning you'll get up and say, Holy Spirit of God, I want you to live through me today. And you'll walk through your entire day controlled and filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God who indwells you. That's my goal tomorrow. That should be your goal tomorrow. And we have that potential, but we have to acknowledge what God says is true. I, I hope you'll do that. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I don't know where you're at tonight, but I, I, I know it seems the general consensus is you're not sure you can be victorious over your sin. But if you take this passage at what it says, this could be liberating for you. Would you go to God right now and just in a time of prayer, and, and 
if you can, just say, God, I, I want to praise you that I don't have to sin anymore. I don't have to. I, I, listen, I'm not saying you won't, but you, you've got to start from a position of victory and, and of truth. I, I don't have to sin anymore. I have been set free. You just shouted it a few moments ago. Tell God you really mean it. You really believe it. And God, tonight, I'm going to opt on my freedom of choice that Christ has won for me. I, I, I gladly bow to you. I, I surrender to you once again the throne of my life. Just kind of picture yourself up there on the cross. The Bible says, Paul says, I am co-crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So just say thank you that I was, I was co-crucified. I yield to you tonight, once again, as the master, the controller of my life. I, I, I want to I stay on that sacrificial altar. And I, I yield the throne to you. Just take a moment, talk to God about those truths right there where you're seated. And then take a few moments and talk to the Holy Spirit. I, I was in a meeting some time ago where a man said, Steve, I've been a Christian 40 years. I've talked to God the Father, I've talked to God the Son. Tonight is the first time I've ever even acknowledged the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He's just as much God as Jesus is God. You need to get to know him. Just take a moment and just say, Holy Spirit, I, I believe you live in me. I want to get to know you better. The Bible says that he, he intercedes for us to the Father with, with groanings and utterings. There are times when I'm praying, and I, I don't even know how to pray. I, I just have to say, Holy Spirit, I, I can't even form into words what I'm trying to express here. Would you just take my heart, and, and he does it anyway, and deliver it to the Father because I, I can't even get this out. But just say, Holy Spirit, I, I believe you live in me. And I, I, right now, Holy Spirit of God, I yield my members to you. And, and go through the members that may be your most problematic members and, 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 and ask him to, to conform you to the image of, of the Son, to look through your eyes and talk through your mouth and yield your members to make you like Jesus. Take a few moments right now. You just talk to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to do that to you. Father, we, we are just so grateful that we can live with the knowledge that you are sovereign in charge. And Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for your willingness to leave the splendor of heaven and to live a sinless life, to die in our place, to, to leave this earth and to send the paraclete, the called alongside one, the Holy Spirit to come and in help, the helper to indwell us. Holy Spirit, thank you for the fact that um, you, you know us, you know our needs, and you, you know how to even communicate in ways that, that we can't. And we want to be mindful of your, your work in us. And, and, and again, we, we just ask that um, you, you would so live through us that people would not see us, but they would see Jesus. I know that's your desire, and I, I, we, we, we once again as a, as a group, we just, just, just want that to be the characteristic of our individual lives and our marriages and our families and this church. I, 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 I ask for myself that um, in these next hours and this next day that I, I would be mindful of you and controlled by you and walking controlled by you. And let that be the pattern of our life. 
pray to remind these folks in the days ahead to deal with sin, with self, and with yourself. And I, I, just, I just pray that um, that would be a, there, there would be a, just a, a sense in this, in this body of believers here tonight um, that, that, that you are who you say you are and that they would be controlled by you, and that, that, that a watching world would see followers of Christ living out their faith. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, in, in, in Francis Chan's book on the Holy Spirit, he says the most, as you read through the book of Acts and, and see what happened when the Holy Spirit met with people the, and, and all the gifts of the Spirit and so forth, the, the most oft-recorded purpose of the gifts of the Spirit was for the good and edification of the church. When, when we are filled with the Spirit, the first thing that will do, it will give us a greater desire to help and edify and build the church. And then we go from this place out into a lost world. So I want to close the service tonight by letting you have a chance just to, to build each other up. I want you to get into some small groups of maybe two, three, four people right around you and just have a short time of prayer. And you don't have to all pray, but maybe just one of you just pray for the rest of the people there that, that these things we've heard tonight, that we would live in them and walk in them, and tomorrow we would start our day dealing with sin, self, and the Spirit. But let's pray for one another. That's all, all the one another's of Scripture is how we build and edify the church. So, so this is the church, not this building, but these people, you people, us, we're all the church. So let's edify one another. So get in some small groups, two, three, four, whatever you feel comfortable with. Have a, just a short time of prayer and pray for one another edify one another, and let's, let's walk out of this place, filled, controlled, let's be back tomorrow night, walking, controlled by the Spirit, and when you're finished praying with uh, a few people around you, you can slip out, and we'll see you back tomorrow night.